So good morning to the brave ones who managed to get up. I want to tell you about automated circuit reconstruction, uh, what we've done to solve it and where the field stands. Not solve it, how we've tried to solve it, okay? Uh, because this will be one of the morales of the story. We're not there yet, but, but I'm hopeful. I'll explain the reasons why. Um, this is joint work of many people. So Björn Andres, who is now starting his own lab in Saarbrücken, Tom Kröger, who is about to defend his PhD, and then uh, Ulrich Köthe, who is heading the group along with me. Um, I show Elastic, and there's a huge, well, development effort behind that. And I want to single out Christoph Strehle, Anna Kreshoff, and Stuart Berg. And then finally, uh, we, we have lots of fascinating data, thanks to Graham Nott, Kevin Brigman, Winfred Denk, and then from Tunisia Farm, Davi Bach, Albert Cardona, and then Lou Schaeffer and Mitya from the Fly EM team. And I want to thank them for the insight more than the data. So, um, this is where we start from, a volumetric image. And we want to find not just one, but all the process in, processes in there. So we want to get a dense reconstruction. Uh, we want the processes and the synaptic connections between them to get a wiring diagram. And this will be the end of one journey and the beginning of the next. Because even if you have the wiring diagram, you have not understood a thing about the brain. So there will be a, a much more network analysis uh, required uh, down the road. But it's also hard to imagine understanding the brain without having its wiring diagram. So this is where the interest comes from. From the image processing point of view, it's, it's not an easy problem for two reasons. One is that all the neurons look alike. Uh, let me show you that in, in images. So I fear some... Um, very beautiful data from Graham Nott, and you see that the resolution here is isotropic. So we have three ortho views, and resolution is as good in, in, uh, in all three dimensions here. However, if I zoom out a little, you see this neuron here. Uh, if I look at its text or its contents, there's nothing that distinguishes it from the adjacent neuron or from that one down there or from that one down there. So the only thing distinguishing them is their position, it's not the usual thing that you have in computer vision where you try to do semantic labeling or uh, foreground, background segmentation. Here, all things look alike. So we have a pure partitioning problem. Moreover, uh, errors are not forgiven. So you know, in electrical circuits, it's really important not to have a short. A single short and, you know, your fumes rise and your set is broken. Uh, same thing here. If we want to find these processes, if we just uh, make a single error, so if we, uh, in some place where the membrane is weakly visible, if we pretend that these are one, we've created a short circuit and we have an error that propagates uh, throughout the entire volume. So this is why it's not, not, an, not a trivial problem. It turns out that uh, m basically all of the work in, the, in this field um, now follows a canonical pipeline. We have um, this you know, these brown bullets here for data. So starting with the raw data, and then at the very end, we have our final segmentations. And green is uh, some kind of, some processing step. And I've cited here a few papers, and I'll go over some of them, or allude some of them, um, representing something like uh, 50 person years of work. So of necessity, my overview will be on a very, very coarse level. Um, but you see that, people have looked at each and every processing step trying to optimize it, including the proofreading, but I've not given references here because that's not the focus of the talk here. I want to talk about the automated tracing mostly. So in pictures, this is uh, roughly what it looks like. We start from the raw data seen at the very left. We obtain some regions that we strongly believe uh, belong together. These are often called supervoxels in the field. And then we try and decide how likely it is that uh, two supervoxels um, should be merged and then come to a final segmentation. Going in a bit more detail here, uh, in this first step, we went, we went to find these supervoxels. We try and determine, well, we need to make predictions somehow. And if we just looked at the gray value at each single pixel, that would not be very informative. So what we do instead is we compute many features. You know, an obvious choice is to just smooth a little bit over the uh, neighborhood. We compute many features 
that somehow capture different aspects of the local environment of a pixel. And then we aggregate all of those features. So in the original image, we start with just a single gray value per pixel. And here in this case, I've shown five or six features. So now I have six values per pixel. So each pixel now lives in a six dimensional space. And in, in, in practice, we compute even more features to capture more of the characteristics of the environment. And then we can use this uh, for a supervised learning step. For that, we need some user annotations. So we have a user telling me that you know, green is not a membrane and red is a membrane. And then I can look at this in feature space. So out of the six features, I've just shown here two feature dimensions. That's feature, di feature number two, that's feature number one. And I have a scatter plot here where each pixel represents, uh, or each dot represents one pixel from the original image. And then you see here the annotations, this time in feature space. And these annotations allow me to learn some kind of decision boundary, which I can then apply to all points in feature space, and then map the result back. <coughs> so to be totally consistent, I should have made this here on the left-hand side green and red, but you know, I've, I've chosen here steps between white and black. So this is to bring the membranes out more clearly, and if I like, I can define more than two classes and suppress the mitochondria and so on. So I want to show you how this works in practice. Um, this is uh, a tool we're developing, it's called Elastic, and so far nothing has happened. So um, I've loaded the data, but no computations have happened whatsoever. And you now see that I can compute different kinds of features. So I'm using a color here at two scales, and uh, texture at some scale. And you know, note that my choice here is not totally random. So uh, I'll talk about an alternative, which is to use neural networks. Neural networks, people say, I don't have to make an informed choice here. The neural networks will learn themselves which features are meaningful. Um, here I have to select something that captures uh, relevant properties of the data. Um, however, I can browse these features. And that helps me deciding which ones or which scale is likely going to be meaningful. And incidentally, you see that uh, as I go from one feature to the next here, there's always a short waiting time. And uh, that is because everything here is computed just on demand. So uh, that is important because the data set that I've loaded here is uh, one gigabyte of raw data. And I've computed three, six, seven, eight features here. So the features alone would be eight gigabytes, which is the RAM of this commodity notebook here. Uh, so even if I just computed all the features at once, I would have no space left to do any computations on them. And this is why we compute everything on demand. Okay, so um, you see the data is being loaded, features are being computed, uh, displayed, and then renormalized so that everything is shown on the same color table. And as new values appear, the renormalization of the rest has to uh, be iterated. Okay, and this is done in a blockwise fashion. So if I now go from one Z slice to the next, uh, this becomes faster because the data is already there. The features have to be computed again on the fly. And uh, this is pretty fast until I hit the boundary of a block and then new data needs to be reloaded. And well, the attraction in this just-in-time computation is that it allows me to work on data sets that wouldn't traditionally fit into RAM. So um, on um, data which has uh, resolution both space and time, I've done interactive machine learning on this machine here on a 100 gigabyte data set. So um, here's my data. Um, I can now define a couple of classes. And let's say I'm using red for membrane and green for not membrane. And uh, then there's a synapse. You see the vesicles, you see the postsynaptic density. So I'm coloring the <coughs> postsynaptic density here. And so I've given these labels. In my presentation, this corresponded to um, this uh, step here, okay, having given labels. And now when I press live update, I train the classifier and make predictions for all points. So I press live update, and now it first needs to compute the features in this area. Um, 
and then with the labels trains the classifier and then ma uh, makes a prediction. And if I now zoom out, as I come to the border of my tiles, it starts making these predictions for the adjacent tiles. Okay, and now we can, for, for example, say I'm most interested in synapses, so I can give negative examples. Perhaps I even want uh, an extra class um, for everything that looks vesicular. So I'm adding another class here and saying this is not a synapse. And pressing live update again. So it has pulled out the synapse, it has pulled out that synapse. Um, there's a mistake here, and it has also pulled out this um, biologist, what is this? Myelin. Myelin, myelin, myelin. thank you. Um, which uh, goes through the entire volume. So um, this we need to distinguish from uh, the synapses in a, in a post-processing step. So let me again show you what, what interactive means. I click on this point and say I don't like it and then the classifier is being retrained and uh, predictions are being remade. Okay, and then uh, I can go to other parts of the volume and see if predictions are reasonable there also, and then iterate this until I'm happy. So, there's a piece of software called Elastic, and uh, I've just demoed you version 0.6, which is not out yet. We hope to bring it out this summer. Um, point 0.5 only worked on data that would fit into RAM. And just now I've shown you this version which works on data much larger than RAM. Um, on FIPSM data, this works very nicely to bring out the synapses. On SSTM data, you have to work a bit harder. So you need to find synapse candidates and then compute more features on these and then uh, make a prediction. But on FIPSM, it really works out of the box. So, so this picture here was generated by painting five postsynaptic densities and that was enough to bring out all of them. Uh, that's, again, thanks to the very nice data here from, from Graham Nutt. So, um, to summarize uh, the short first part, uh, interactive machine learning, uh, to our mind, makes a big difference, uh, because the traditional way would be that you, uh, let's say, Monday you give labels, Tuesday you train, Wednesday you look at the results, uh, and that makes for a slow turnaround. And moreover, if you don't know in advance which labels to give, uh, you, you, need, you may need to label quite a lot. And in this case, you've seen me um, given just a single dot in a point where I was not pleased. So I can uh, bring the human in the loop and do some, uh, well, we call it interactive learning. If the computer actively asked for points, this would be active learning and such schemes can be embedded. So I can, for example, say I want to look at the uncertainty and then it uh, color codes where the uncertainty is highest and where it could need more labels. Over time, um, we find that it allows even people who don't make a living out of image processing to, to understand what helps and does not help so, for example, if you define too many classes, the program will tell you. Uh, or if you, give, if you try to distinguish classes that, given those features, cannot be discriminated, you will see the effect immediately. If you've given a bad label, you will see it immediately. So, that's what we, what we mean by dialogue. And in our experience, this has really helped reduce the time that you need to train such a regression scheme. Um, once you're happy with your, with your classifier, you can uh, press a button called uh, batch prediction, and then depending on how big your data set is, you can grab a coffee or um, go for dinner or go on a holiday. Yeah? So the, the, biggest that we've, uh, the biggest that we've tried is on an 11 terabyte data set, and uh, so we've crunched, I think, nine terabyte out of this. And uh, this was only possible using a compute cluster, and uh, so that was more the holiday kind of endeavor. Uh, for the technically minded people in this new version, there will also be an object level classifier, which I'm happy to tell you more about in the, in the break if you like. So uh, rather than doing pixel classification, we can now do this interactive training on object level, and that allows us to 
uh, solve more difficult problems like finding the, synap the synapses in SSTM images. And if anyone's interested in counting, um, I, I am also, and we think we have something going there. Okay, so you've seen us take this detour. We started from the raw data and computed features and then trained a regression scheme to make a prediction if something is, for, exa for example, membrane or not. Neural networks propose to uh, bypass this explicit separate feature computation step and do it all in one go. And that has some merits. So if done well, this uh, performed extremely well. So for example, neural network won a recent ISB challenge on uh, SSTM data. Also, once you have your network trained, this is super fast and you don't need to specify the features in advance. So you saw me click on certain scales and on certain features. Neural networks learn these by themselves. On the downside, you need a lot of training data. So a neural network of the kind used in this field here has uh, of the order of 50 or 100,000 parameters. So of necessity, you need a lot of labels. And uh, if you're fortunate enough to be able to pay for you know, an appropriate number of students who will label, that's good. Um, but, but otherwise, uh, that, that's not a good thing. And uh, training is slow, so it easily takes a week on a GPU cluster. Can be longer, can be shorter. Uh, and then uh, we put black magic in uh, picking features. You know, network people have to put some black magic in specifying the topology of the network. So how many hidden layers, how many neurons per layer, and so on. And these choices matter. Um, however, there have been papers uh, that have used them successfully and in particular propose very clever training schemes. And I want to single out here the Malice scheme from Srini Turaga. I mentioned these short circuits which you want to avoid. So here's a color map of um, probability of a pixel being inside a urine. And what you want to avoid is these bridges between separate neurons. So the idea here is to burn the bridges and for that, you need to first find the bridges and then give a high weight to these pixels and tell the neural network to lower the estimated probability in these spots. And that is done by finding uh, paths between, um, between adjacent neurons and then the lowest pixels on those paths and then among those lowest pixels, the highest one. So this is the critical, this is the worst point that you want to improve. And you can do this iteratively, a uh, scheme that works very well. Okay, so at this point, we have a weighted graph on the voxel level. It can be either edge-weighted or node-weighted. Uh, edge-weighted would mean, do these voxels belong to the same neuron? Node-weighted would, would mean, uh, is this a membrane or not a membrane? Then we want to partition this graph to obtain supervoxels or small regions. Here's an example where supervoxels have been computed simply on a, on a specific feature. So we have these very small regions that now already are somehow adapted to the data. So perhaps you can see, you know, there's something running down here. So having these regions allows us to extract more meaningful or more descriptive features. And uh, a few years ago, people tried to you know, go from the raw data to the final result in, in just a single step. And it turns out that it's not possible. You need an intermediate stage where you then compute features here on this uh, region level or super, super voxel level, which you can then further process. Um, this partitioning into regions traditionally happens by either uh, just using a watershed or connected components. Um, but for, for some purposes, you need not just one partitioning, but multiple partitionings. And there have been a couple of suggestions. So there's one by Emilio vasquez Reina from the Pfister lab. Um, Jan Funke did something um, together with Albert Cardona and us. And Christoph Trell from my group tried something else. So the idea here is uh, that it may be difficult, so this uh, these weights here may not be perfect and it may not make sense to operate with a single partitioning, but perhaps you want to get multiple interpretations of this and then work with these multiple interpretations together in subsequent steps. 
and then once you have such regions, you can compute um, a likelihood that two adjacent regions should be merged. So shown here are all the boundaries of all these regions that you had just seen, and the color coded now is one specific feature. I don't even know which one. So we look at things like um, I have a boundary between super between two super voxels. Um, how different are they in size? Or um, what is the lowest boundary probability along along this boundary, and so on. So you know anything you, you can invent. Uh, that, that looks remotely useful can be applied here. And here you see an example of different features that are all color coded. And then all of these features together, and we compute many, like 40 or so of them, uh, all of these features together can finally be used in another regression scheme, which again needs to be trained on uh, using, using some human input. And now this makes a prediction if uh, a boundary should be eliminated, if it should be turned off, then this is shown here in red or if it should be kept on, then it's green. And if you look closely, you see some intermediate colors where the classifier was not quite sure. And that kind of information can now be used to merge adjacent regions. This merging traditionally happens by using a hierarchy. And uh, there are a couple of papers. So Vera and Jane, who has a group at Julia Farm, uh, did this. Uh, Tolga Tasdishin and colleagues did it. Um, uh, Nunez Iglesias uh, Juan did it um, together with co colleagues from Genelia. Uh, here's an illustration. I'm showing here three boundary candidates and then a tree that expresses how likely it is that two adjacent regions should be merged. So in this case, uh, the boundary between A and B apparently looks weaker given the data. So <coughs> if there will be any merger, it will be first between A and B and then between the resulting big region and C. Okay, so here are the possible segmentations that you can produce. You can, I've, I've shown a threshold here. I can either threshold my tree here, and then I get these three regions out, or I can threshold there, then A and B have been merged, uh, but C is still distinct, or I can put my threshold up here, then I get a single large region. Um, however, there are some segmentations that cannot be expressed by such a hierarchical tree. So you cannot put uh, any specific threshold here. Still, this tree is a, is a data structure that allows for very efficient computation and inference. And these papers here have interesting policies on how, how to learn an appropriate merging strategy. So you want to learn both these propensities of two adjacent regions to merge, you want to do this right, and then given the tree, you want to find the proper threshold, and this uh, threshold here, I've shown it as a horizontal line, if you have a bigger tree, it can also be something more complicated, you can cut the tree in, in different heights and in different places. So it's a good approach, but limited in that it cannot express all segmentations. Uh, we've done something that can express all segmentations, but is more costly. So. Um, we use a different representation, um, a dual representation where each boundary can be flagged as on or off. Um, it's good because it allows to express all segmentations. Uh, an alternative to using this dual representation would be to give an index to each region. So we could say this is region 1, region 2, region 3, and then if I want to merge two regions, then I give the same index to both regions. Uh, however, by working with this dual space, we can work with a much smaller label space. We don't need a large set of indices, we just need zero or one indicator variables that tell us if, if a single boundary is on or off. Uh, this avoids the graph coloring problem that's implicit when you work in a primal domain, and it avoids degenerate solutions. What I mean by this is that if you use indices, I could call this region one and this one two and this one three, or I could call them two, three, one, or one, three, two. All of these are different, well, they're the identical solution, but different representations of the same solution. It's just an expression of you're using a label space which is too large in the primal domain. So this is why we work in the dual. The price that we pay is that consistency is no longer guaranteed. So look at this configuration here. I've switched this boundary on and these other two off, but that's nonsensical. So 
if I look at these two points here, um, there is a path separated by a boundary which tells me that uh, you know, these points should be separate. And then there's another path that connects the two points without crossing an active boundary, which tells me they should be disconnected. So I have a, uh, I have a dispute here, which I need to resolve. And this is how we do it. Um, it's an approach called correlation clustering or the multi-cut partitioning problem. We define simple cycles, so cycles that do not intersect with themselves of a specific length. We demand that they all be consistent. So uh, each indicator variable for a boundary must be either zero or one. Boundaries should be on or off. And then the important, one important bit on this slide is this inequality here. It tells me that the, the indicator for one boundary must be less than or equal the sums of the indicators for all other boundaries, you know, for the entire system to be consistent. So we have a simple cycle here. This boundary is being on, so one of the y's is on, and now I demand that one be less than or equal the sum of these two y's. But these two have been switched off, so this is zero plus zero, and then I have that one is less than or equal zero plus zero, which is not true. Okay, so I have a violated constraint, which I can then use to update my system. So we take this entire set of constraints. If, if we take all of them, this is an exponentially large set. So it's not even possible to write all of them down. However, what we do is we start without constraints, optimize the problem, um, then find a violations efficiently in polynomial time, add these constraints, and iterate this. This is called a cutting planes approach. And so the optimization problem that we solve is the following. We have a cost theta associated with each boundary. And in this case here, theta is a vector. So those are the costs for all the boundaries in my three-dimensional image. And then I have a vector of indicator variables that tells me if all of these boundaries are on or off. And I want to minimize this inner product. So I want to minimize the cost of all the boundaries that are on. Subject to um, my solution being, being a legal one, being a consistent one, being in the multicut polytope. Now, if all of my losses were positive, then the solution would be trivial. I would simply switch all boundaries off. However, the problem becomes more interesting if some of the thetas are positive and some are negative. So this is the non-trivial situation uh, that, that we're facing here. And if you look at this problem, then so we are minimizing this over y, and that's linear in y. So we're minimizing a linear objective that's as easy as it gets. So you have a vector pointing in this direction of, of theta, and you just want to walk as far as you can in this uh, uh, against theta. Um, and then we have this multicut polytope. And if it wasn't for this uh, condition here, if it wasn't for the fact that y has to be binary, this would be a convex polytope, very high dimensional, but convex. So we would, do, uh, we would optimize a linear objective over a convex body, which is very well studied and an easy optimization problem. It's called linear programming. However, here we are restricted to binary solutions, which makes it an integer linear program, um, which is NP-hard to solve in general. And in fact, the correlation clustering or multi-cut problem is NP-hard. However, there are very good solvers around these days. So we simply use uh, one of these uh, industrial weight solvers to solve the problem to global optimality. And because we've solved it to global optimality, we know that all mistakes in the final solution are ours. Okay? So we've, uh, our modeling has been deficient uh, or we've not trained the classifier well. It's not because we've not optimized the system well. We find really the globally optimal solution on very large data sets on up to millions of random variables and uh, all remaining mistakes are ours. On even larger systems, one can use heuristics to find approximate solutions. So um, here's an example. If I just threshold these votes of single classifiers, that's what I get. And if you look closely, for example, the boundary is on here but off there. So this is inconsistent. This is taboo. And uh, if I now did a connected component analysis on these thresholded predictions without the multi-cut constraint, 
I would remove most boundaries by transitivity. So you've seen that most boundaries here that were green have turned yellow, which means that the classifier here believes that the boundary should be on, but somewhere in the third dimension, the classifier believed that the boundary should be off. And then by transitivity, all of the other boundaries had be, you know, they melted away. So this is why just thresholding the boundaries is not enough. This is why we need the, um, this is why we need the multi-cut constraint. And here's the solution. So if you compare, um, if you compare to just thresholding, you know, we've fixed all these uh, loose ends here, and we've done so without introducing a bias. So when you have such loose ends, you could have heuristic solutions that say, okay, when there is a gap in a membrane, you should close it. Or you could say, if there is a single membrane somewhere, then erase it. But you know, that's a bias going one way or the other way. And the thing that I've presented here, this correlation clustering, gives you an unbiased solution. This is why it's worth a superman up here. As I said, uh, on the downside, um, this is computationally very expensive. Now, I, I didn't mention how, how we find those penalties for, indi or for switching a single boundary on or off. Of course, we want to learn them from training data rather than uh, invent rules by hand. And we can either use unstructured learning, ignoring the consistency constraints, or we can do structured learning, uh, potentially even uh, with the structured loss function. And uh, you know, summary of this graph is that the unstructured methods here, they are shown with these horizontal bars. In terms of RAND error, they are doing worse than uh, doing this structured learning. So this is good enough to produce uh, pretty pictures. And uh, each lab working on the, in this field has its own pretty pictures. However, it's not good enough to do you know, science. Uh, let me show you why. This is a solution that we get from um, this multi-cut constraints. And I've uh, blown up a small part here, highlighting some errors. So you see there's a thin process here which we've segmented into, you know, we've totally over-segmented this. We have a boundary too many here and there and there and there. Of course, we've, and, and also there's uh, over-segmentation here, we've biased the system to over-segment rather than under-segment, because in subsequent steps, over-segmentation is much easier to fix than under-segmentation. And also, you know, from this 2D slice that you see here, I've really picked the, the worst bit, so it, it looks quite okay in, in other parts. Um, but it still means we lose the fine processes. And this is why, you know, starting at the somata here, we don't get the very fine branches uh, of these arbors that really should be there. Shown here is only a minute fraction of all the cells. The, se the partitioning has been done on all cells, but if I switched all cells on, you would just see a colored cube. Okay, so this is why uh, uh, some cells here have been selected randomly. So this multi-cut partitioning part, uh, we believe in this dual representation. Uh, it is, as I said at the very outset, it's a pure partitioning problem. We have nothing that distinguishes locally one neuron from another one. The scheme that we have is unbiased, so it doesn't bias towards either closing holes or opening holes. And we get the optimal solution on pretty big systems, and we have a, a heuristic beyond. Learning of this is luckily fast uh, compared to neural networks, but as I pointed out, it still doesn't have the accuracy that we need to really get the full circuits out. I've been talking about the processing of uh, truly 3D data. So on the right hand side you see uh, Graham Knott's data x, y, and then x versus z. And uh, I've, I've tried to indicate here um, two neurons from a, s a red slice and then from an adjacent blue slice, and I wanted to show that uh, the, vo the volume of each neuron only overlaps with itself. So if you have that kind of data, you can truly do the segmentation in 3D. If you work with serial sectioning imaging, um, then the X versus Z plot looks like this. And uh, if I, you know, those are actually the same neurons, but now this red neuron here 
overlaps in the next slice with both this one and that one. And now you can argue, but it overlaps much more with the top one than with the bottom one. And indeed, you know, this can be uh, exploited and, and worked on, but it's a little less easy than working in, in three dimensions directly. Um, I want to refer to a couple of papers here who, who do this. Um, they all produce multiple segmentations. So here is an extract from the Jan Funke paper where he showed that in these three regions, actually different thresholds or parameters, parameters of a segmentation method are best to do justice to, you know, to produce the proper segmentation in these different regions. So all of these possible segmentations are arranged in a tree and you do this for each slice separately and then you want to simultaneously select the best segmentation that can be represented by a tree within the slice and you want to connect it with elements from the next slice. And that works reasonably well. Reasonably well, but again, uh, you know, not the accuracy that you need to get full dense circuits correctly. Now, I'll be very short on the proofreading, um, even though this is, uh, you can argue, the most vital part these days. When computer vision people started in this business uh, seven years ago, they were ambitious and they wanted to solve the whole thing automatically, and, and we still do. Um, but it turned out that uh, it was not as easy as hoped, and this is why today most work is semi-manual, so you start with a, you start with some conservative auto automatic result, and then you try and fix it. Okay, so there, are, you have to distinguish if you just want to skeletonize or if you want space filling segmentation, and uh, Knossos and Catmate, for example, allow you to trace manually um, the neurons. Um, then there are semi-manual schemes. Um, I have two ones in gray, which I think will come out in, uh, will be made available to the public. In all of these schemes, you start with an over-segmentation and then let the user merge regions, or uh, I think Reveler can also split regions if, if there was an under-segmentation in, in the input that you received. I'll show you carving, which uh, uses one particular strategy. So I'm adding some data. This again, Graham Knott's beautiful data. It's been a little bit smooth here in all three dimensions. And I can now compute uh, a watershed on this. I'm simply using the raw data here as is. And I'm telling the algorithm that boundaries in this data are dark because the algorithm need, needs to know, you know, what are boundaries? Are they bright or dark or what are they? And you can do this on the raw data or you can do it on probability maps. And so this now computes uh, watershed segmentation. So rather than work on a million of voxels that the 3D data set had initially, we now work on only a region adjacency graph of 60,000 super voxels. And uh, all subsequent operations now happen on this region adjacency graph. So I can, for example, say, uh, make this green, and uh, I have a special background class that grows a bit more aggressively than the rest. Then I get out a segmentation, which is, uh, you know, has been bleeding out here across this membrane. So there was a weak point somewhere in the membrane. So I can uh, say this is another class and press segment. And you see that, um, these response times now are very, very fast because we work only on the super voxel graph rather than on the rather than on each and every voxel. And then I can look at the result in, in 3D and you know keep working on this and uh, correcting and so on. And the well, the strong point of this algorithm is that because it has because it relies fully on human input. You can solve anything, uh, you can segment anything. However, how much effort it is will strongly depend on how good the boundaries are. Okay, because this always grows, these seeds 
um, well, until uh, it, it grows all seeds until they fill the entire volume. And if your boundaries are weak, then the seed will bleed through places that you didn't have in mind. Uh, also, if you work in 3D, it's important to have an uncertainty indicator because you don't want to keep browsing uh, to and forth in the data to spot the errors. So, you know, I, I spotted these errors manually now, but at some point this becomes very hard in, uh, in very large data sets. So a few things I haven't talked about are special features that uh, people develop, like the Radon-like features or Ray features. Um, then you can do more work to, to get a smarter regression here. For example, out of context, um, stacks classifiers where the next classifier works on the output of the previous one. This is, uh, has some relation to the deep learning from neural networks. Or you can have a bias towards closing boundaries. So I mentioned that we must avoid these short circuits. And Verena Kainich, for example, has a prior in her conditional random field that will tend to close such small holes. Okay, so as I said, uh, it's around uh, 50 man years worth uh, on, on this uh, slide alone here. Now, I tried to give a realistic picture. I hope I haven't sounded too pessimistic or too optimistic. I, uh, I, I tried to render my proper feelings here. Um, I'm going to about, talk about the future now. So, you know, as always, this is attributed to many people. Uh, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Uh, that's disclaimer number one. Disclaimer number two. Um, people always get the difficulty of computer vision questions wrong. So one reason is that we do it so well. We have on, you know, in, to our advantage, we have a few million years of uh, evolution. And the moment you open your eyes, you cannot help parsing everything you see. Uh, so you open your eyes and you see this is a door, this is a board, this is a seat. And uh, it just works so seemingly effortlessly that we don't even realize how hard it is. And even people who should know better, you know, keep making this mistake. Um, one of the most latent mistakes, <laughs> in the, if you want to call it that, is this 1966 uh, summer project from Seymour Papert, who proposed to solve a big part of the computer vision problem by a couple of, you know, visiting students over, over a summer. Um, this is like, you know, the, the Bill Gates statement about the RAM. This is the same thing translated to computer vision somehow. Huh? Um, so those are the disclaimers. Uh, having said that, I am still optimistic and uh, I think that one of us groups working on this will be able to report uh, complete success a few years from now. Um, why am I so optimistic? Because the number of categories is small. So humans easily distinguish of the order of 10,000 different categories, whereas in this data, if I look locally, or all the categories that I need for segmentation are, you know, maybe 10. So I have uh, intracellular, extracellular, I have uh, vesicles, I have mitochondria, uh, I have synapses, I have ER, um, I have myelins. Um, but, you know, it's, it's of the order of 10. Um, then secondly, you know, as computer vision people, we always uh, you know, we, we hate the noise in the data and, and we ask for better registration and so on. But still, the variability that we get in these very nice images is much, much smaller than what you see in the real world. So in this sense, it's easier than the generic computer vision problem. Also, some of the errors that we make are still, you know, of the embarrassing kind. I've, uh, I've, shown, you, uh, I've shown you some of the errors that we make here, you know, it's pretty obvious to a human that, you know, this should be connected. And uh, if, if I look at these membranes uh, here, the, the boundary evidence on this membrane will be so much stronger than the boundary evidence on that one. And uh, apparently we, we don't have a feature yet that, you know, captures these relations between different boundaries associated with a, with a single object. So some of our errors are still 
uh, sufficiently stupid uh, that we should be able to fix them. So we get the shape sometimes very wrong, or we, we get the size very wrong. Uh, if we have something tiny, we know that this cannot be correct. And then, um, for humans, it's often very little context that is re required to make the correct decision. So I'm showing you this iWire game from the Seung lab here, and I've tried and traced this. So I, I was given the blue thing, I've added a couple of super voxels that are here colored in green, because this is building on the output of a neural network trained with Mellors. And then the program tells me, based on the output of other players, where I was wrong. So I was wrong here and I was wrong there, and I want to point out two things. So one is, if I as a human had done the blue and the green thing, I wouldn't exactly know where to look for something that I might, I might have missed. You know, I would look here, I would look there, perhaps I would look also here because there seems to be some kind of kink. And then secondly, if you look closely at, uh, you know, where I lost one of these objects, um, or, you know, didn't follow up, we have this very regular structure here. Uh, also, that should be able, that should be possible to, to be captured by features uh, to say that, you know, that is a mistake that must be fixed. Okay, so there are my reasons for optimism, which brings me to um, my wrap-up here. Um, we develop these things open source, so we use Vigra for the image processing and basic machine learning. I want to advertise OpenGM, which is a very nice library for combinatorial optimization. That's not really meant to be readable, but so OpenGM either implements or wraps all the state-of-the-art inference methods that you have. And we use Elastic for this interactive learning, for batch prediction, for seeded segmentation, and in the new version for object classification. Summarizing, um, I've shown you this canonical pipeline from raw data to super voxels to emerging step. Um, right now, even a single human is still better than us, but redundant tracing. So many humans are required to produce fully accurate results. And uh, for us on the computer vision side, just the sheer amount of data, it makes everything hard. So even just, you know, adding numbers becomes hard when you deal with giga and giga voxels. Um, tomorrow means a uh, few years down the road, so uh, I would say a single handful number of years down the road. I think we will have automated tracing in high quality data. Here are some of the directions that uh, we and others are exploring. Um, what's limiting us today, us automated people, you know, brains, of course, as always, um, but also programmers, I think, because um, it's not in the interest of the ordinary PhD student, and, you know, they are really the ones who push science. It's not in the interest of a PhD student to develop a huge infrastructure. They want to get their paper published. And then you want the next PhD student to be able to build on the work of the previous one, and for that, we really need programmers. Those are the brains I refer to, and programs also have brains, but you know, it's a different kind of uh, task here. And then um, the people who are very, by, well, who have a great affinity for biology, um, with some happy exceptions, are not always, you know, the greatest experts in computer vision, and the greatest experts in computer vision, um, they typically have no incentive to, after having published their paper, go and spend the next two years and making a nice piece of software that gives this tool to biologists, really. So in this computer vision community, there's no incentive or funding to, you know, make this program writing step. And uh, biologists, on the other hand, say, uh, you know, what you're doing is not biology, so we don't fund software development. So that's a practical problem. And then uh, a few years ago, um, the lack of data was a big problem. And thanks to initiatives like the Open Connect Home and the INCF activities, I think data is uh, accessible fairly well now. Um, the next bottleneck is the annotations. So where humans have said this is connected or not connected, we need this both for training these methods, especially those with many parameters, and powerful methods have many parameters, and to m gauge performance and to make, you know, go beyond these pretty pictures and measure progress both within a lab and between labs. So I hope that um, a few years uh, in one of the next INCF congresses, there will be someone on stage with a mission solved uh, talk. And uh, in the meantime, I thank you for your attention.
Thank you. Um, spectacular talk, again. Um, I think it's incredibly uh, impressive the, um, the way in which we're actually you are able to address these questions which previously, you know, are, I, I had always considered kind of a science fiction challenge. Um, Thank you. Now, having said that, um, it's interesting that, that obviously when you zoom down to the, the lev to the EM level, you're always kind of very much in the weeds and you're looking at intrinsic connectivity within very small voxels, uh, within very small volumes of, of tissue. But it's one of the characteristics of neurons that they can be up to meters in length in terms of their axon. Um, and when people consider connectivity in terms of the organizations of systems, they're usually talking about how these long-range connections transform information from one area to another. So um, how far away are... So in terms of the partitioning problem and figuring out how uh, a population of... a chunk of tissue is, is, is wired up, I can see that's very much in your wheelhouse, and that's what you're tr aiming for. Could you comment on how this work will inform the questions of organ, uh, neural connectivity at the level of populations and ensembles of cells, mm -hmm. possibly millions, probably hun well, hundreds or tens of thousands of cells so communicating with each other over large spaces? I think this is going to happen, um, or I believe this is going to happen. Um, when I say that I hope to, that someone will be able to claim mission accomplished in a few years, I'm referring <laughs> to FIPSEM data. And I've, uh, you know, I've uh, made a slide here uh, which shows that no method is perfect. So FIPSEM currently gives the nicest images, but it shows much too small an area to address the questions uh, that you have uh, raised. Even so, it allows to do interesting biology, and I think having dense FIPSEM segmentations will, will offer new insights biologically. Um, in the long run, we need to go to one of these methods, and um, the so the serial bug face people and the serial sectioning people, um, they are working seriously towards uh, imaging entire brain regions, and I think we will have entire brains not too long from now. And um, so this much lower Z resolution obviously makes the automated tracing harder, but I think that once we can do it for the FIPSEM, I am hopeful that in another stage we will be able to do it on, uh, or the community will be able to do it on uh, these kinds of data sets also. And they are definitely going in the direction of these long-range connections. Uh, um, I, I think uh, imaging-wise, uh, the, the kind of length that you refer to will be available a few years from now. Okay, maybe one short question. Very short, um, very practical and nested question. So you showed us that your um, current segmentation pipeline makes mainly mistakes at the very fine um, little um, branches. Um, if it does not make errors at the larger branches, and the answer is um, yes, it does not make errors there, um, does that only mean that you need higher resolution and the problem is solved? If we had even higher resolution isotropically, it would, you know, it's, it's always meeting in the middle. You have the computer vision people and the imaging people, and we are walking towards each other, so the images are becoming better, we are becoming better performing, and higher resolution would help. I, uh, you know, unless we get the kind of images where we threshold and do connected components, it won't solve the problem, but it would help to get high resolution in three dimensions uh, at low noise levels and with high contrast. Yes, that would help. But you still have some errors in the in the higher um, in the larger profiles as well, or no? I think our errors are really in the small parts now. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank. Uh... Thanks.